Receive with me. Yes. yes. Okay. That's oh, that's perfect. perfect. He does it perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Theater and round. The theater and round. Okay. Yes. All right. This is supposed to be the theater. It's supposed to be the theater. That is our intern. Speak me, she's on. When Sarah asked, oh, don't forget attendance. That's her um, Sarah asked if she could bring the baby. I was like, yeah, we can her. Yeah, too, because I think that was her. Huh? The interview. Yeah. This is my intern. Absolutely. He's not quite getting it yet. <laughs> She's going to be able to explain a CMA and an appraisal gap coverage and an escalation clause by the time it's four. What is the first word in the block box? Because did you let them open them when they want to leave? Yeah. It's a little bit of how old was Andy when you got her? Was she an infant? 13 months. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was 13 months and about 15 pounds. So she's been really tiny. And I remember coming back from China. I was in China. And somebody said, so what do you think she waits? Because the information they gave us was all in, you know, European measurements. And and she was, according to their measurements, she could have been like 25 pounds. And then you looked at her, you're like, no way. Yeah. Um, and I said, oh, I think she's about 15 pounds. And I'm like, how do you know that? And it's basically the same as my whole life. And I'd rather be the doctor three days after we landed in the States and she weighed 15 and a half pounds. <laughs> And I know she gained weight after what well, while we were in China because we actually fed her, you know. So yeah, cute little girl. Okay, she was 12 30. All right, so we started on time. So I want to set the stage here. Um, so first of all, Brittany, thank you for coming. Um, by the way, the dining room um flowers are yours. Oh okay. yeah. um sweet. So we are selling a house today. Um, we can't take you all out to a home. That would be a little cumbersome to take a million people or even 15 or 10 to a home for a real live listing consultation. However, you're going to see a live listing consultation. Brittany is going to convince me to sell my house. So she has the stats on my house. She's been to my house. We've actually done the walkthrough. So she knows what she's got and she is here and prepared. So she's come into my house. We've done the nice and nice things. She did the walkabout in the consultation, right? Because that's the first thing that we do. And I'm going to now start. So bring me my dish of glass of water. Yes. All right. And then the refrigerator. Okay. Well, that's what's in our Now they're at the dining table. Now they're at the dining table. Hey, right. here we go. Margaret, I love your home. It's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. So remind me again of all the updates that you've made. Well, we bought it in 2020. And so the only thing we've done is we matched, we hated the carpeting upstairs. So we found the flooring that was on the main level and we just replaced that all the way through the house. So it's all hard service all the way through. It's beautiful. Thank it's you. Beautiful. So thank you so much for having me. Sure. Okay. All those good stuff. So let's get to it. Okay. So why are you selling? It's time for a slower lifestyle. I'm going to retire and probably move back home in where's home? Um, Iowa. Iowa. Have you already started looking at homes in Iowa? Uh, a little bit. I thought a little bit about having a home here and there because I have family in both places, but thinking it's probably time to just pull the trigger because Iowa did this really cool thing. They passed a new thing with their tax laws that retirement income is no longer taxed mm -hmm. in the state of Iowa. So that suddenly made it very attractive to Yes. So, with you moving to Iowa, do you have a time frame that you need to be there by? In my perfect world, I really don't want, yeah, I'd like to be there probably September ish, October, be there for the holidays. And have you ever sold a home before? Been a while. Okay. Perfect. 
So what would you say is your biggest factor with wanting to sell? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for the usability of selling? Are you looking for timing? If there's one thing that I can deliver to you and be completely accurate on, what is your motivation here? All of those. Okay. One thing. Honestly, probably the money. Money? Yep. Okay. When you're retiring, money matters. Okay. Perfect. I Um, so with that, do you have an idea of what you're looking for? Well, based on what I saw happening last summer, there's not been a lot of them selling here until recently, I guess. Um, I'm thinking probably mid fives. Is that what your neighbors got? Or well, I saw some of them that sold for I don't know, 525, 530, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, you know, and you know, time is my time, the appreciation, right? Market's going up, that's what they say. So you can and I'm not right by the school and I'm not right on Highway 72, so I'm tucked in here so I don't get all that noise and all that crazy traffic in the morning. Absolutely. So what was the biggest selling feature for you when you bought this and you built? Why'd you pick the lot that you picked? Where it was, yeah. right? Being, it's in the middle, right? But it's not, so it's in the middle of the complex, but yet the way they've got it set up, I can see, as you can tell, I can see the mountains over there, and I can see some foothills over there, and I miss all the traffic going on again. Perfect. Well, I have brought some comps with me, so we can kind of go over pricing, okay. um, and I can kind of show you what what is selling, what isn't selling. Don't worry about the market. Before we get started on this, I kind of want to explain to you a little bit about the Denver Metro because it's been a while since you. Started. Yes. So here in Colorado, we're a very seasonal market, and so what I mean by that is we kind of have highs and lows. Sometimes the market moves a little bit faster, sometimes it moves a little bit slower. So in our perfect world and kind of what has been happening over the last three years, we typically see an increase of activity in our market in the spring market. Sometimes it changes, um, believe it or not, the Broncos, actually if they're in the playoffs, get stalled out of our market a little bit. If they are not in the playoffs, then our market tends to pick up in that February time frame, so a little bit prior to spring. So usually January is pretty slow, February starts to pick up, March gets pretty hot and heavy, and that continues through really July 4th. And then after July 4th, I see a huge dip in sales. Okay. So Labor Day, like Memorial Day kind of also alters a little bit of it. So usually the first week before and the week after we kind of slow down. So I'm telling you all of this so that when we go to time listing, we know exactly what we what we're going to be listing. So Memorial Day tends to be a little bit slow. Fast forward after July 4th, we have another tip. So we have a lot of people that are done with their vacations. Most of those buyers are already settled because they want to be in for the school year. Okay. And then we start to see, depending on the year, depending on if it's an election year or not, um, things will either pick up or slow down from August to about December. Okay. okay. One of our best months in real estate is always December. And partly because People pull their homes off the market in that October time frame, and they don't want it shown over that. So the reason I ask is, what is your desired time frame? Is I need to know kind of what we're going to do, or how we're going to maximize your money, how we're going to get you to where we need to be on time, and then have the convenience of selling as well. So based on what you're telling me, you're an ideal candidate to basically list in this spring. So what we're going to do with that, there might be a little bit of an inconvenience when it comes to selling the house as far as showing some traffic and all of that stuff. Okay. But it's our best opportunity to make the most amount of money in the least amount of time. That's what I want to hear. Exactly. So with that being said, that's a general overview. Obviously, okay. COVID kind of messed some things up for a little bit, and we had some time like in there to slow down, speed up, you know, do all of those things. Um, but based on what you're saying. I would realistically like to get you on the market in the next couple of weeks. So, okay. We want to see what we need to do. There's not a lot that you need to do in the house. The house looks great. Okay. So there's not a lot of prep work that will go into it. There is some staging and some photograph and all that. And I have a whole marketing plan that will be true. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, as far as timing goes, that's what we're going to be. So the next obstacle for us is going to be pricing. 
Okay. And so with that being said, I have taken into consideration everything that has sold last year at this time and everything that has sold the last six months. Okay. And what you need to understand with pricing is although an appraiser can go back a full year with comparable properties, it's highly unlikely. And so what they'll do is they'll take into consideration the market the time of the year ago and they can deduct and depreciate whatever the value is of that. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. It just depends on what current market conditions are. One of the things that we pride ourselves in is we study the current market conditions. And when I say current market conditions, day by day, week by week, we are in it, knowing exactly what's happening. We know the multiple offer situation. We know how many buyers actually view a specific property that went under contract. We know what the list price is going to be in the coming soon and if they have prospects coming. So the reason I bring this up is because our last year sold the January, February, and March, we're in the mid-500 range. Mm -hmm. The last six and seven months with the current market, they're not in the mid-500 price. Eek, or where are they? Roughly, where we're going to need to end up to be is probably a range of between like five and like 520 is what we're going to need to be. Okay. So what if we so right now there's nothing for sale. Nothing for sale. In in the town homes, right? There's nothing for sale. So what happens if we list it higher than what you say? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if nothing happens in a couple of weeks, we can always come down, but I'd really like to get that 550 if we can. So what happened? What what are your thoughts? <laughs> so do I have permission to share stories with you? Uh, so you not about me, that's fine. <laughs> so, what can $79,000 How much can what? $79,000. How would you spend $79,000? Guys, limit? Whatever you want to make. What for $79,000? I'm probably buying a new car in addition. Perfect. Great answer. One of the things that we learned this time last year, I was sitting with a fellow directly across from me. I gave them a price of their home, told them that we would be priced at 700. They hit and hawed for a little bit. We listed a month later as the market was starting to shift in May, good time frame. They insisted we list at 750. Insisted. I agreed to list at 750. The comparable next comparable property next to us was at 730. The next one was at 715. The next one was at 700. I have been saying 700 since March. Fast forward to July, we're at 700. Most of our comps now are selling in the exact 700, 690. Okay. October. I finally secure our first offer on this property at 675. Oops. Exactly. It did not close because my sellers were not willing to put on any roof. They were willing to give the buyers a $2,500 credit for the deductible, but they were not willing to put on any roof. Do you want to know what that property sold for in February? Almost a year later? Almost sure. Year. 620. Ouch! $170,000 is what they missed out on because they were not committed to a price that made sense. Okay. I know I would have secured them $79,000 more at that time in that place if they just would have priced with me when I asked them to price with me at the correct price of where the market was. Okay. Pricing too high is going to cost you money. Okay. And I can give you example after example after example. So what you need to understand is when you hire us, you're hiring our experience. You're hiring our years of doing this. You're hiring our marketing. You're hiring our connections, our network, our, our company, our office. We have a team of people that surround you in knowing that we are being priced aggressively in the market to net you the most amount of money and the least amount of time. Our listings, on average, Heckenberg Group listings are selling 4% higher than the list price in a whole. It's actually 7% higher 
than what the average is of the competing realtors in our neighborhood. So I'm netting people 7% more than what they are doing. And part of it is because it's not because I'm underpricing. We don't underprice. We actually try to price to where we're at the very top of the market because, again, my biggest goal is to keep the most amount of money in your pocket. It's not to take money away from you. Okay. But how do, we, how, how do I know that we're not pricing it too low? How do I know that we're not giving it away, right? Because understandable. You know, like how do we you know? Understandable. So the reality is I don't get control. You don't get control the market. None of us get to control the market, right? In the, and we've seen this. And part of it is, too, with all of our comps back in January, February, and March, you remember that last year? Mm -hmm. Do you know what interest rates were at about that time? A lot lower than they are today. A lot lower than they are today. A lot lower than they are today. So interest rates were 3%, three percent, three and a quarter, all of that. Buyers had full advantage of this. So what they were doing is they were essentially overpaying for the house because they had really low interest rates. So that's why we have these inflated values last year that we're not necessarily necessarily seeing right now in this market. Okay. Do you know where rates are at now? I have no idea. They're in the high fives. Yeah, depending on what, between five and a half to six and a half, depending on whatever it is. Well, cheaper than 14% that I paid on my first house. And I think that was good, uh, you know? And so it's one of these things that we have to take into consideration the market conditions around us. So while I appreciate, are we going to be priced too low? What I can tell you is, there's a few factors leading up to it, right? And we'll know that pretty quickly. For every six showings, I should have one offer. That's how every one of our listings, that's how every one of our listings have played out for the last two years. Every six showings, one offer. Once I hit six showings and we have an offer, the goal is to have multiple offers. Okay. And the pricing strategy and the marketing strategy go hand in hand. We're not here to overprice it because it's so quick to overprice. It's going to add things on market. And the number one factor taking money out of your pocket is things on market. Okay, I can see that. All right. So when we start to get longer on the market, then we need to have conversations about price reductions. No, we don't do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can get you to Iowa in the time frame that you want with the most amount of money. Because that's your biggest goal at the moment. Okay. So you said again the range was what that you would list it at? 500 to 525. And okay. so one of one of the factors too with our comps. So a lot of the comparable properties that you had seen last year that were selling between that like 530 and the 550, they were all the three bedrooms. So there was a lot of three bedrooms. So that's where if you're seeing that price and you're seeing your neighbors, we have to understand that we need to compare apples to apples and oranges. Some of those were end units. And so there's a factor with that. Now, we might get really lucky. And what I will tell you that's happened to us in the last three weeks, because we statistically are seeing the shift right now currently in the market. Every listing that we have listed in the last three weeks, we have gotten multiple offers and we are hitting it 5% above our wireless prices. So that could get me back closer. To it that could get you even closer to 550. Okay, that makes sense. But the issue is we don't have to compete with 13, 20, 50, 60, or 180 days on our bid. So we want to keep buyers engaged and invested in your home in the least amount of time. I want the buyers that are ready, willing, and able and are ready to pull the trigger right away. Those are the ones that are willing to pay for your house. The buyers that are shopping in the market and looking at properties 15, 20, 21 days on market, those are not the buyers that we want. Okay. All right. So what's the marketing plan look like? It's the marketing plan. So we have a menu of items. And so we do three different types of packages for our sellers. Okay. And you're allowed to kind of pick which what you want as far as that goes. Um, when it comes to condition, when it comes to commission, and when it comes to marketing. Okay. So our first plan is full of usually we <laughs> Who can ever rely on Wi-Fi yeah. and yeah. else's I normally do. 
So our first, I'll just go through it. So our first plan. By percent, it basically has nothing on it. Okay. <laughs> so there's like in the MLS flyer. Okay. Okay. So our next, our next one is six percent. We have a little bit more. So it's like how clean. I'll pull it for a second. Like how clean, matter port, marketing, um, prospecting. Then our next one is six and a half percent, and it's like the whole package: area photos, videos, um, broker opens, open houses, clean in, clean out, moving boxes. It's a whole package. Um, and so usually I'll like show this to them. Um, Co-op is two and a half percent on this. On the five percent, it's not really a package I ever recommend. Partly as if we start to ever see an increase in inventory, what agents do, and I don't even know it, but what agents will do is they'll look at what they're getting paid and they're gonna weed yours out right away. So we want to be able to be competitive with our co-op fee. And 2.8% gets us into these two packages. With this, we're doubling our marketing and our exposure with our sellers that are doing this package. They're on average between six and eight percent of our list price. So when people say, oh, does staging really work? Oh, does cleaning the house really work? Oh, does minor repairs really work? It's benefiting our sellers and more dollars we need from cash. Okay. So that's this package, that's this package. What are you more comfortable with? Well, I like the five. That puts more money in it. It actually does not put any more money in your pocket. I figure you're talking, you're talking one percent. But if over here I'm getting sellers eight percent more, and you have to, and you're only paying one percent more, I'm actually netting you closer to thirty thousand dollars more on this than I could if you're this. So thirty thousand dollars that's a lot of money. Okay, so this one is six. Okay, so wait a minute. So this co-op thing, this two yeah. eight and then two five. Yeah. The buyers don't pay their own agents. They do not pay their own agents. Well, that's silly. It's silly, but it's just the way of the game. It's the way the game goes. Do you remember when you bought? Did you pay your buyers again? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. No. There was all kinds of fees. I just wanted to try a lot of fees, and you know three. Thing is, to be totally honest, we want to work with agent. We want to work with an agent on the other end. Okay. So we want to work with someone that's competent to know what's going on and be an advocate. Because the goal is, I want you to have a happy transaction, and I want them to have a happy transaction. Because when we have a happy buyer and we have a happy seller, everybody's happy. And it's my job to be the intermediate between us agents. So I won't come to you with problems. I'm just going to handle everything. They're not going to go to their buyer. They're going to handle everything. We want to co-op with professionals. And if we have professionals that are continuously discounting their services, it makes for a rocky transaction. Okay. Okay, so another question. So, okay, so this one's five. So, okay, we'll take that one out. So we have six and six and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we went with the six because I don't need Ariel in a town hall, right? If we went with six. Oh, so yeah. You've got, okay. Not to interrupt you, but let me ask you this. So you just said you don't need the area on the town hall. What did you tell me was one of the factors that you picked your lot? <laughs> Oops. Because it was in the middle of the complex and I needed all the traffic in the school kids. So don't you think buyers are going to have the same feeling? You're really good at this. <laughs> okay, so regardless of which one, we have to pick. Okay, one of the things that attracted me to the Hackenberg group was that you guys talk about you have a lot of buyers. Yeah, we do. So if you have a buyer who's looking for my home. Mm -hmm. Does this go down at all? It does not go down. Okay. It doesn't go down. So we're still doing the same amount of work. We're doing the same amount of work. Both our buyer and both you, our seller, are going to have exceptional service work with us. So you're here to ensure every aspect of the transaction is being nailed in and dialed in with no problems for you. So no, the commission does not go down. Okay. The only reality is, and I like control. <laughs> so one of the factors too that most people don't understand, it doesn't matter if I have an outside buyer or a buyer. 
when we go, remember, we're pricing at the very top of where my thumps are. We're right there. So I can have one appraiser pull an old, maybe outdated comp, maybe something that doesn't make sense. So what we're doing is we're making sure that when you meet with the appraiser, which we meet with the appraiser, we are handing him essentially for her all the comps, all of your updates and all of your upgrades. We are explaining to him why you picked the lot that you picked and why your lot is better than the one that's over there. So guess what? On my comps, I'm discounting all of the comparable properties that are back into Highway 93 or high or 72. Back into 72. So they already know where our mindset is and what number and what value I want. That service is going to happen regardless if it's my buyer or somebody else's buyer. Okay. Because again, at the end, I want to make sure that our buyer knows that they're not being ripped off on a price and I want to secure the highest amount for you as well. Okay. Nobody feels good when their house doesn't agree. No, that no it doesn't. And so the same amount of effort throughout the entire transaction is still there regardless. Okay. Right, so one more question. Absolutely. So if you bring your buyer, yep. okay, how do you avoid, well, how do I make sure you're representing me and not fighting for them? It depends on the agency agreement that we're in, right? So, and I guess better question for you is, when you say me bring a buyer, are you speaking to like somebody walking into an open house where I have no representation, or are you talking about someone that I'm in an active buyer agency agreement with? Do you know the difference? I don't. Okay, I don't know the difference. Right, most people don't know the difference. So let me explain to you the different fees in agency here in Colorado. Okay, so we have what we call a transaction broker. So our transaction broker, I like to think of is the referee. The referee. So they basically take guidance from either the seller or they take guidance from the buyer, okay? Depending on what agency you're in. We have seller's agent. Seller's agent exclusively works with sellers. So they are advocating for their seller. They are able to do opinions. They're able to be basically an entire coach. We have the same idea on the, on the buyer side, right? Okay. So buyer side also has their coach. So TV, referee, buyer, seller, agents, act as a coach. And then we have what we call as a customer, okay? okay. Customer is probably not something that you ever want to be treated at in Colorado. Customer, you have no representation. I have to be fair. So if I'm working with you, because my listing agreement, I'm going to your exclusive seller, right? And you're exclusive seller. I get an epic you. I get a... Tempt the appraiser with Girl Scout cookies and compare the <laughs> right? I get to do all of that on my end to secure your price. Customer, I'm hands off. So the reality is, even though if I do have a buyer, especially a lot of my marketing efforts should generate a customer, okay? okay? So they should generate a customer. I still have to treat them fair. I still have to treat them ethically, but I'm not doing anything to go above and beyond. You're still working for me. I'm always working for you. Okay. Always working for you. Okay. And the reality is, if we ever get into a situation where I feel I am in a buyer agency agreement and a seller agency agreement, and I can't do my job effectively, I will tell you. Okay. That sounds fair. Okay. All right. How are we marketing this thing? Well, I would like to start photos next week. So, so I'm going to send you an entire time frame. So this is how our process works. So what I traditionally like to do, I like to photograph either like a Monday, Tuesday, and we'll kind of build our time frame out, right? So right now, Jeff will Public School goes on spring break next week. So I don't want to do anything next week as far as that goes. I'd like to photograph the 28th. So I can get my photographer in there the 28th. If that's too much time, you can push it back another week. I want to be on market before the middle of May, period. So that gives you some time if you need to do anything that you want to do, but I don't want to go to market anytime later than the event. So with that being said, this is your timeline. Timeline is I'm able to photograph on the 27th, 28th either. Get the photographer in. We'll have a turnaround. We're going to be in a coming soon status for full seven days. Coming soon status actually gives me a little bit 
of wiggle room when it comes to price bait. So what I mean by that is I can adjust the price based on activity and how I feel market it is going, and it's not going to negatively affect you. So when you're telling me what if we miss the mark on pricing and what if we price too low, if I'm not getting a lot of activity or inquiries or any of that in my home soon status, I can adjust the price based on our conversation. And once it hits the market, then that gets a little weird about changing anything to do with pricing, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, because it's going to stick to the property. If I go into the listing history, so if I go into the listing history, you can actually see the price changes in a coming soon status. So if we priced it too high, we would know. We would know we could adjust it, and nobody would know we made that adjustment. Did that go the other way too? If that we start here look too low, and we realize, oh, there's enough activity. We should not have to move it up. Yeah, a lot of it is going to be a lot of it is going to be based on my showing activity. Because we'll be able to schedule showings while they're coming to status. The phone calls I get from agents. The phone calls I get from my blast of our in a little internal community. So we have active buyers that are searching for specific properties. So everything will be email blast to them as well. So I can gauge that. I can gauge the traffic of our like our map report and our website to kind of see all that. And so it's all just depends on where we're at. Most of the time I don't ever actually adjust price because I'm usually right on with where we need to be. I can hear wrong sometimes. That's always been on that. <laughs> but I don't plan on it for you. I don't plan on it for you. Okay. So I think I should give her the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as it's not a real job, because all these specifics are making me nervous. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done. We hired her. Okay. So I wasn't too mean to you. I was like, oh, you were great. Okay, I think you're great. So I tried to get in all of the major objections. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can't, I don't like this. I don't like it. My back's a good word. Um, um, so now, so that was three minutes. Okay. That, that, that was pretty much what we see now. In and out, she was quite on the ID. Right. Um, Brittany, were there any areas that Marna didn't push back on that you often would get pushback from? Not really. I think, you know, commission is always kind of a pushback. We found when we started doing like the menu type stuff, mm -hmm. we found that. Really eliminate a lot of push happens to see because then they can actually see, and it's actually like decent. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't pull it up because it sounded like really crappy, but it's not. Um, there's a lot, of, and there's quite things too. They there's things in there that doesn't necessarily cost you money, mm -hmm. right? Um, like one of the things like prospect marketing, right? So it doesn't necessarily cost you money, but it costs you time, mm -hmm. like to make phone calls and pick up the phone mm -hmm. and do the you know, all of those things. And so the difference between like six and six and a half or up is a lot of that half a percent is actual money that we fork out, right? So it's the staging, it's the food for the broker open, it's the aerial, it's like all of the stuff that really starts to add up, but it doesn't make a difference in the end for the sellers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm willing, and I'm willing to do all of that um, if they're committed to paying a higher price, right? And I can definitely have sellers be like, I like this, for this, and we're like, well, then we're also taking this, this, and this, and this off. Like, you know, so we don't budge too much when it comes to that stuff. Is there like give and takes, of course. Um, but I think it's also important to know, it's important to know your seller's motivation, you know? And so sometimes we'll get heavy pushback on price. And at that point, I shift the conversation to say, okay, I know that the price is where it is. So now at this point, I've learned from the one that was $79,000. Mm -hmm. um, so now all of my listing agreements, I have a termination fee in there of $2,500. So if you want to terminate with me, early termination, I need to recoup my money. Mm -hmm. And I feel built in there when we are actually doing price drops. Mm -hmm. So 
on a week by week, I am tracking inventory and my sellers can get a spreadsheet from us. And it's basically what went under contract, what pended. Um, if the agent is willing to disclose that price, it's on there. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And so you can see, so week by week, my sellers are knowing what is happening in the market so that we can quickly adjust. And it all kind of gives a synopsis of all the marketing stuff. This is where we're at, this is showing, this is our feedback, this is for good, this is for bad. And even though we get feedback, sometimes we still get the phone calls to say, hey, thanks so much for submitting your feedback. I don't know all that. Like, what do you really think? Like, if I know, like, if I know, like, there's going to be cat smell that nobody's willing to put it in feedback. Yeah. And they don't. Mm -hmm. Like, agents are really hard about putting anything negative in feedback. Mm -hmm. And I will say that. Um, as a buyer's agent, if you are competing on a property, don't ever put anything negative in feedback. Mm -hmm. um, always sell, always sell the house. Um, if your buyer has no interest in the house, mm -hmm. be brutally honest. Okay. But if you're the buyer's agent, don't be brutally honest if you want your interest to go for me. Um, because I actually look at that stuff. And then I'm like, well, we're paying the last buyer that is, but then they're the ones that are spending, you know, putting the offer. So like I pay attention to this. So when we have two or three or four offers and I'm going to for feedback and I have a buyer that's like nitpicky and this and that, but I have an option from them, it kind of sets the tone for mm -hmm. what it is. It's mm -hmm. when it's hard to make a decision, right? Like when you all are putting down similar money to have, and they all have relatively the same price, the you know, same closing date, da, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Good to know. And I can share that information with my seller because again, I'm their advocate, right? Mm -hmm. So just that, so there's different things with that as far as pushback goes. Um, I think pushback I get is it recently is if I ask them to make repairs and then I don't repeat them. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been something like really heavy. Mm -hmm. And so I have to draw them back into like one of my sellers. Uh, she doesn't want to do a lot of paint. Well, she doesn't want to paint, she doesn't want to take the TV down to paint. Okay, so there's a huge old TV on the wall, and she's having painters come in, and I never removed the damn TV to paint because the TV is going with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just going to look bad. And then she's going to have to do it at some point, anyways, but she doesn't want to do it now. And so I'm like, look, when a buyer goes up to the top and they're looking at the loft and they see behind that you didn't take the time to remove the TV to hang it, it puts some doubt in there. And we're going to be at the top of the pricing. Like, we're not at like low, low, low where the buyers are going to overlook this. We are trying to secure the highest price in that entire neighborhood, which is good will. But I'm just saying the only way we can do that is by improving condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a lot of pushback for most of my sellers is, you know, I know that door is like chipped and broken and ugly and you like stuff with white out, you're going to have to replace the door or sand it and paint it. Mm -hmm. You know, which is silly, and I know it's not the best, mm -hmm. but again, we are in this weird kind of intermediate market yeah. where, like, we kind of have the really desperate buyers that have the word and security thing, but then we have like buyers that are kind of looking for ear and looking for picky. So it's like this, like, kind of balancing act of like, who do we have? Like, there was a day where you could probably have like a pile of dog crap on the floor oh, yeah. and still get it. 15,000 yeah. quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like gone. So mm -hmm. those things are gone. Yeah. So I feel condition is just as important mm -hmm. as pricing. With Margaret's health, condition is not an issue. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not even an issue. So we, I don't have to necessarily have the condition talk with her, but I would say probably half of my sellers I have to have the condition talk. Yeah. yeah. You'd have to talk to me about the garage that was lost. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that's, and that's, I would soon tell you stories about today's market because mm -hmm. you can absolutely not touch the door or not yeah. touch the television, but then that price that you want to get becomes increasingly yeah. to reach. And, and, and it, it's it's the buyers can market. And that's that's mm -hmm. the that's the that's the biggest thing. The longer we sit on the market, the more money comes out of the seller's pocket. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would rather, and this is me personally, I would rather push off listing for a solid piece. The sellers can make these minor little repairs as opposed to rushing coming to market 
Because at the end of the day, it's just gonna take money out of their pocket, and, you know. And you're talking like I just had my auxiliary today too. Like, she's not very happy, but I'm like, I would work for three hundred dollars, but the door looks great. like right. it's like been dog chewed through it. It's just a little bud. Mm -hmm. And everything else about the house looks good. She's like, well, it's gonna take me a week. I'm like, great, that's totally fine. Yeah. I don't have like 15 houses I'm competing with at the moment. I have mm -hmm. three and I handle that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not gonna get 15 houses to come on market in the next two weeks. So I think taking your time to improve condition pays off. Now I don't want someone doing a full on remodel at the moment, because I don't know what's gonna happen in seven or eight months. So that's different. But does that answer some of the questions? Okay. Great. Any more comment on the feedback? So one of the things that I always try and do as a buyer's agent is that I never know who's getting the feedback first because there are agents out there who let it go directly to the seller. Mm -hmm. So I never do that. Don't do it. Don't do don't be that okay. answer. Don't do that. Don't be that listing agent. However, as a buyer's agent, think that the yes, person they might get very likely may be the seller. Mm -hmm. And so I always do my, I start I'm with a thanks for letting us do your property, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I always, it goes back to my HR days when we do used to do reviews. You give them something positive, you give them something to re, to work on, and then you finish it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I do try and find something to yeah. complement that seller. Yeah. Because here's the deal. If the agent is garbage, if you give a good feedback, they might remember you. Always. And when they get that expired listing and they still want to sell it, who might they still call? So I think that as a marketing thing, but I think I'm not afraid to admit to them and say, my seller really thought the door between the garage and the kitchen should have been updated because your dog's in scratching. Mm -hmm. Right? That's reality. That is true in my house. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they know that, right? They know that the cat could be in the basement or whatever the scenario is, right? So be honest, but be careful how rural you get. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't be nasty about it. Like, I was just pissed yeah. around to show that you yeah. need That's the voice part with Ricky, right? Yeah. But always think that you're advertising to that seller. Um, yeah. And then what was the other thing you were talking about? This condition, right? The thing that I would tell the seller is, is that if they look behind the TV and you haven't painted it, my very first question as a buyer is what shop hats have you offered? What else have you not taken sure so I think mm -hmm. you can start noticing that too. Well, that's the thing. Like one little thing you know, just like kind of trickle down. Yeah. It's not having good team. Mm -hmm. They have surgery and themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that right? So it's just, it's kind of one of those things where I'm like, just take care of it. Or if you're not, then at least allow me to have that conversation. Because when I come to find the house that says, you know, to me, it's kind of a beast, um, but it will be painted once it's removed, right? So that buyers don't have that objection walking in, you know? So again, I think at the end of the day, it's always about communication. Like we will send out just in, the, I mean, so I'm not to think that I'm reviewing the selling property disclosure before we go to market. That does not always happen. But one of the things we do send out is like the frequently asked questions, right? That you get from buyers agents because I want to know that. And one of the questions on, I mean, it's like simple stuff like we're gonna talk about your roof, like sewer line, da da da. Um, because you're always gonna get asked that. But the other thing is, like, what made you buy this home? What do you want in my marketing for me to really highlight? This is my student stuff, like the lazy Susan. Okay, I would have never mentioned the lazy Susan. I love lazy yeah. Susan. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm like, okay, so it just depends, right? So I think knowing what they want so that you don't have these weird conversations when it's been on the market seven or eight days, and they're like, well, you didn't put this in there, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, right? Like, we're trying to avoid all of that. And highlight the house to where they feel really good about everything, you know. So, do you guys notice when I push back on the marketing at six and a half? What she did to me? Oh, yeah, what she did, ninja. She reminded you of why you bought the property and how uh, aerial photography would show that off, it's, right? So, what was she doing? Listening, well, just listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, just sitting there, I mean, I, yes, we were kind of playing, but the reality was it was through my house and I was telling you stories. And the fact that she remembered that, I was like, 
Like, right? Wait, that's what you gotta do when you're out there because you gotta pull them back to. Like, it was getting hard to like cover why I didn't want to hear six and a half or something. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, I, yeah, but I don't know if can make them up. Like, my wheels were turning because I wanted to give some more. And I, I was like, the, the reality of regardless of whatever we all charge, right? We don't really have patience. Um, whatever y'all charge is like you have to be confident in the value that you provide clients at the end of the day. I mean, my next door neighbor, they should be selling in like two, three days. They hired the 1995 company. This is a 1.46 million dollar house, and they hired the guys to sell their home for 1995. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Because did they not find anybody that they found value in? We just for the score, by the way. Um, because it might be a good like mm -hmm. for you know, yeah, yeah, it is under contract. So, it's a great house, it's a great house, but um, no, but my point is like clearly, like people are willing to always go the cheap route, you know, and so you just have to be able to differentiate yourself from it. What I can tell you, and this is square to God true, um, I just closed with these same guys last week, and I I was on the buy side, and they didn't do what they said they were going to do in the resolution, and so I said to him, I'm like, what about this? What about this? I don't think this didn't happen, and he screenshotted back to me in a text a resolution from a different property. Mm -hmm. Oops, there's a lot, and it doesn't matter how much state charts, there's a lot of crap. Yeah. And so, I mean, just looks like, well, first person is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, why don't you pull resolution for this one? But it's like that type of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And he misrepresented the state, and I got my buyer's $20 for mm -hmm. because he couldn't put in the right for me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it cost the seller. And the beautiful thing about it is, my amendment sent to them said, because you misrepresented the HOA fees, mm -hmm. my buyer seeking twenty five hundred dollars for compensation. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that a conversation to have. Nineteen ninety five isn't looking so. That's for me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying, like, sometimes you get what you pay for. I'm praying to God, they go other one free. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it's just one of those things where you're just like. There, you would have to be a value too, right? To your sellers, right? So you have to be able to prove to them why you're worth it. And that's the bigger thing. So let's go back and roll play. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Brittany, um, okay, so I'm good with the commission. Let's go six and a half. You sold me on the aerial. Um, I started to be a little nervous about honey. So I said I wanted to move in September. Yeah. Today's March. 15th, 14th, whatever it is. If we go under we go to the market at the end of the month, and with your marketing, we end up closing by May 1st. Yeah. I'm not ready to go. Like this, this feels a little, this makes me a little nervous because I'm not ready yet. See, my crystal ball is broken at the moment. I'm telling you is what's happening in the market right now. Okay. Your September time frame is going to take money out of your pocket. And that's happened year over year over year. If I were able to net you $15,000 more in May versus September, would you move? Probably. Maybe. 30? 30,000? Well, yeah, 30,000. Yeah, I guess it's an Airbnb back there. Um, so, but can I like sell it and then rent it from the new people? We can do a variety of things. So this is what I call like the buffet, okay? So the buffet looks something like this. I want sellers say, I want to stay in my house for 60 days and I want the highest price in the house and I want no showings whatsoever and I just want people in my house for two hours and free for all. Doesn't always work that way. Right. So what we have to do is we have to leverage some of this. So if price is the most important thing for you, okay. there's a possibility that that buyer that's going to come in is not going to let you stay in that house for 60 days. So there's a give and take. 
There's a give and take as far as that goes. And typically with pricing and post-occupancy agreements and the amount of showings and the timing, there has to be a pyramid that we're building to. Again, if it's price, I need to know if I'm to secure a price for you that's 20, 15, 20, or 30,000 over lift, can you get your stuff out in three and a half weeks? Oh, yeah, I guess I can hire somebody for that kind of money. <laughs> Most of us could. And if not, I have a way to come to the The reality is, interest rates are doing this boom, 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 boom. You're in a wonderful position right now where rates have just come back down. So, what typically happens is that every time we see some volatility in the market, which is true, every time we see some volatility in the market with interest rates, it dulls our market out for a couple weeks. And this is stuff that we've been tracking for the past couple of years. And what I mean by that is now that we've had interest rates kind of come down and buyers are going, where are they going to come down more? And so they're pausing some of their search. So we can time it that last week of March, because rates dropped this week, then buyers are going to be back in full force in March. And they're probably be willing to spend a little bit more money because guess what? 30 days ago, your house that was valued at 515, they were basically able to buy it at 500 because of the rate, right? Okay. Now we're at 515, they might be able to come up to 520, 521, 525 because of the interest rate has been so significant to them. What I can't control is I have no clue what interest rates are gonna do in August. Right. Yeah. And so the reality with that is I can say, no problem, why don't we wait? But there's a couple factors that push in a timely time frame now. So with our marketing, our gold standard contract will no less than two weeks. So if you're really vested in moving in September, you probably need to be on the market at the end of July. Of July, everything kind of stalled out again. So it's not the best time to sell. Then we have back to school. Things stall out with back to school. So again, our time frame, what's happening with that specific time frame is it's taking money out of your pocket. We're losing buyers. Okay. Awesome. I have a question about price drops. You yeah. said that you schedule those in your contract. Yeah. And I'd just love to hear yeah. your opinion, but also other experienced folks. You know, nobody wants to do one, but what's your strategy with them? I mean, they're not even about it. I think the reality is they kind of know, right? So if it's in the listing agreement and I'm like, by this day, by the, like you guys know, like you know what the market's doing, right? You know what the market's doing when you go into a listing, right? So just like Mark said, and to be honest with you, I normally don't really price the house until I go after the MLS. And so, yeah, like I, one of my listing agreements, like last week, I'm in this week, and I'm going to market $50,000 for what I totally would last week. And partly it's because I have no inventory now. So two weeks ago, when we were looking at all of it, I had a lot of practice to choose from. And so I don't get super specific about it. With that, and I know it's going to sell, so it's different. So the conversation with like the price drops and all of that stuff is, you know, when you go into there where the price needs to be. The reality is, you're going to get pushback from your sellers of like, well, my house is when my house is done. So what that looks like is, let's just for easy number of okay. So if you're telling them that the house is worth five hundred and they're saying, well, it's at least five twenty five. So I like bracket pricing. So I like the $25,000, right? So like five, by 25, by 56. Um, it's just funny to me. But with that being said, so if we get to 525, I'm like we'll try your price out for no more than that. And then you have to kind of move to like data because if you have something that's like actually priced really well, it is, you're just selling in four days. So 90 days is actually two days long to be making any adjustments. But, so you have, in your listing agreement, agree to this price. If by this specific date the home is not under contract, seller agrees to reduce the price. Mm -hmm. And so then it makes that a really easy conversation to have with them saying, if you turn it out, 
I got nothing. Mm -hmm. And you don't have anything. You know, if you're actively negotiating, again, like my goal is I really truly want an MFR phone number, right? So if I'm kind of actively, or I have somebody circling around or that, then I'm not one to basically drop that agreed price price. I might instead call that agent that's circling around and say, hey, I think we might be doing like a 5,000, 10,000 to see if I can get that higher up then mm -hmm. before I commit to that 25,000 mm -hmm. restriction. Mm -hmm. So again, it just kind of depends on how you want to play it. Mm -hmm. And then you're someone for sure, you're okay, you can figure it out before they drop 25,000. Mm -hmm. But it's just all kind of like a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Margaret and Stacy and Rhea, I mean, anybody who has experience with this, I'd love to hear your approach to the price drops, which we've seen right, the price, price improvements yeah. that we've seen in the last few months. Yeah. I mean, we've both been in the business, we both got our license in 2014. I mean, often we had to do a price reduction right. since then, like, not much. Mm -hmm. um, a couple, but not not often, honestly. Um, it's been a seller's market for <laughs> I mean, <laughs> however, if I go back to um, the price, that's um, they definitely pushed us on the price. We actually probably looked at that on the floor yeah. mm -hmm. And they yeah. pushed it, and we absolutely put it into the contract that said they had to do it because I knew they were pushing me yeah. on the price range, right? Like if I would have continued to push Brittany to go to 550, I would have expected her to say, okay, I'll play, mm -hmm. but in 10 days, we're going to five and four. Mm -hmm. Right, I would put it in the listing contract. Mm -hmm. If they take my pricing or they're close enough to my pricing, I may not put it in the contract. However, sometimes we miss, right? Mm -hmm. And you did a great job setting that expectation mm -hmm. right from the very thing. Like, this is where I think it is. I'm not always perfect, but I'm usually there, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. then I go in armed with data yes. and I'll go, this is what we looked at when we set the price at 520. Mm -hmm. Here's since we've been on the market, and I did this with you the other day. Here's the comps. Here's what was on the market when we hit the market. They're all still hitting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's what's come on the market since we did, and they've all gone under contract. Yeah. So you start to see where your competition is as you're playing this game. Mm -hmm. And then I have the conversation and say, look, these move because of price. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, it depends on where they started from. Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah, and I think the other piece is, and I do, I mean, I really do reach out to the agents, choose properties that go to their contract. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of know, right? Like, if I'm in a position to be able to preview something before, you know, like if it's been on the market, I'll go preview my competition, which is a trick I learned like 20 years ago, because nobody has to do that anymore. Uh, but you might, I mean, with the market shift, you might have to start previewing your competition, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that being said, you know right away, and the, like Stonebriar is a perfect example, like seriously, if you guys would be keep up with my price, I am 100% confident they would have 80,000 over the market, basically. 100%. And it was one of those things, week by week by week, I can say, Hey, we're missing it. We're missing it. We're missing it. We're missing it. We're going to get to a point where even 650 is not even reachable for us. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't happen. And so you can see that being a professional of what is actually going on in the market mm -hmm. to where you can quickly shift and adjust. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is the majority of the agents around us don't work that hard. Yeah. So they're the ones that are having it up for us. Mm -hmm. So that's just pretty damn easy if we just vote it about our numbers today. You know, and we know, and then you're the expert, you know. But I like those overpriced mistakes that I'm, you know, sitting with. And I like the fact that the agent doesn't know what that property is selling for down the street. I love that you know, and it's relatively easy. One of the things I do is that when I'm even in the inkling seats, like I don't know the other day that's out. Green Valley Ranch, my least favorite place in the Velvet, that's okay. Um, I will put a circle to be so many different yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, you know, watching out, yeah, out there. Um, you get affordable housing, expensive transfer fees, yeah, the whole banana. Um, however, I have now searched in the MLS for a half a mile around this property address, and when something new comes on the market, 
do a minimum range to go out and see that house. I take a printed copy of the MLS and I write notes about the house. Mm -hmm. And I just tuck it away. Okay, because then when we finally go on the market, because we will someday, I can go out there with the information to why I saw this house. Yep. And I saw this, and I saw this, and that helps me with that seller. And you know how else it helps me with? Yep. Yeah. 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 And I have discovered that they did not replace the cabinets, mm -hmm. that all they did was they did a really good paint job yeah. mm -hmm. on them and put some hooks on it. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. the countertop was not stone like it was. Mm -hmm. They had the mm -hmm. stuff to make it look like it was granite. Mm -hmm. No appraiser would have known that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. But I had it written down. So when I met to my appraiser package, I said, oh, by the way, and house across the street. That kitchen looked like a totally remodeled, but I was in it. And when you can say, I was in it, mm -hmm. that gives you credibility with those appraisers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of my tricks that I create yeah, yeah, every yeah, home too. around my listing, even if I might not get it for two years. Right? I, I keep an eye on it. At least keep an eye on it. I was going to ask you, like, maybe, uh, so you didn't have it here. You said yeah. normally you would have the menu services to yeah. here with them, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> what else do you bring to the table when you go to your it's Definitely comp. I mean, so I'll have, like, comps. Like, I like that quick CMA stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're doing on there. I just, it's all in my head now because I looked through it this morning. But usually I have it in front of me. Yeah. Because I can show Margaret. I'm like, yeah, see, these are 25, 25. These were the three bedrooms, right? Right. These ones that just sold at 489, those were the two bedrooms. Right. So it's easier to have a visual. I love visuals. Yes. Um, and so they get a heads up on my pre-listing. So I'll email a pre-listing package. Okay. And it's in there, like the five, the six, the six and a half. Okay. And so it kind of cuts the tension, like when people are like, how much? Because they kind of know what it is, right? Yeah. So they already know what it is. Gotcha. And so I I love pre-listing stuff um, with that. So they emails. Back in the day, I would like drive it to their house. We don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, not now. yeah, we just email everything. So would you be willing, if you do not yeah. have to say yes, would you be willing to share that menu oh, for sure. with those of us that are in here? Yeah, for sure. If we could email it and then Stacey will make sure that you're here. Yeah. yeah. If you're here for the benefits, guess what's coming to you? So when you talk about your pre-listing packet, so you yeah. send it out digitally with yeah. your menu services, yeah. what does your pre-listing packet look like? What does that mean? Because one of the things that we hear at Ignite is, here's your listing presentation and you create it out of command. You know that she didn't have one, mm -hmm. right? And she didn't even reference that I normally bring it. She didn't talk yeah. about that, right? She's got a pre listing packet, but we teach you about the listing presentations that are sitting in command of me. What works? Like, how did you get it? What does it contain? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's like a couple different, there's like a couple different things. One of the things is um, I actually don't enjoy talking about myself at all because I am a high team. And so I don't really care if people like, know anything about me like a lot of kids a lot of kids don't know that when you have four children because it's not ever about me right like I'm in there to do one job so our pre-listing talks a lot about us like who we are what our values are um yeah our years of experience and one of the one of the pamphlets in there is questions to ask the realtor and then I answer it right like how long have you been in the business how many homes have you sold you know, what are the areas that you work? How is this full time? Is this part time? So, like, that's all that stuff that like, gets established ahead of time. So, I don't have to go in. And that's the thing. Like, my listening presentations are not, I mean, I would lose my mind if I know about these things. Because I don't want to be in them, right? So, the pre listing package is a lot about us and who we are, what we do, what our values are, how many homes we sold, like, all of that stuff. So that just kind of gets out of the way. So I figure 
if I have a seller that cares about that, they probably already read it. And if I have a seller that doesn't care about it, they're one either going to ask me about it, so I'm sitting in front of them, but it does me no good to talk to them about all the really great things we've done. So many years. They just want, they just want money, right? They just want like, they just want to know you're going to do a good job, they can trust you, and then you're going to net them money, right? So, so I don't have to spend 30 minutes talking about myself. Well, and you had two high bees sitting at the table. Right. So we just went straight to the table. Okay. So hot, so so the high bees are that's the this mm -hmm. not the work. We are much of this. I'm not. This. Yeah. Um, and we're actually going to bring in more in this. Yeah, no, this is not detail. Um, a D stands for a driver, somebody who is very quick, right? And so um, that's a D. And I is very much about wanting to be your best friend. They're very relational, right? A lot. I'm a very high D, high I. So that's right. I bounce between the two and it changes back and forth depending on the day I take the test. Right. This one is the farthest thing from the B. Right, you you're a C, C artist, artist, or you're a high S. High S C, right? Not really. It's needs adaptive. Okay, yeah. right. Needs adaptive. And the S stands for. Oh, is this the DI situation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then the C is detail-oriented. Are the engineers and the account CPAs? Then we want to guess what time this is. Right? So, yeah. but I put a lot of D in there too. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Right. But I tell the story all the time. Stacy and I can both tell you the same story. It'll take me one minute to make her five. Right? Because she's going to make sure you know the details, you have all of the, that's yeah. the background, yeah. and everything. Well, wait a minute. Was it? Was it a red <laughs> right? And so recognizing what that other person is, and we're bringing the skills up in, in June, but we're going to dive deep into that to teach you when you're sitting in front of somebody, you know who you're working with, right? Immediately. Immediately, right? And you probably have picked it up on the phone or any other conversations. But if you're working with somebody like Ricky and I who are high Bs, and we're under any kind of stress at all, I don't have time for your story. Like, what do you want? Let's go wrap it up. Come on. But if I have to switch it, and that's the thing. So I learned on disc, and I'm happy to teach this because I love this. Uh, but anyways, on, on that, like, you have to also know who you're, like, sitting across, right? Because if you are, like, you have to know who you are. But then you also have to know who you are. Because, because if you're with Heidi, they could care less about your entire life story. <laughs> so you just keep your mouth shut and you just give them what they want to hear, right? And even like one of my closings today, they're both in sales. They're so funny. Like I could tell they were getting irritated. So he was like going through their notes. And I know them very well. And I just said, you know, Dawn, uh, do you guys really want her to come through everything you want to know? No, 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 no. And I'm like, they just want to say. I go, they actually have to be somewhere in the middle of the Like, I might have to meet the current people at 15. I mean, they're very, like, they're very good at their jobs. They're very high sales, sales. And so I was talking to them about this. And I said, I said to them, like, I am not detail oriented. And they're like, really? That really surprises me. And I'm like, yeah, because I can be the chameleon and know who I'm working with, right? Like, I know these two are very high eyes, and what they appreciate is details. So I over communicate. I don't want to, like, because that's not my personality. But I over communicate with the two of them multiple times a day because they don't read text or emails. So then I call. But it's but it's just one of those pieces where it's like you have to know who you're working with so you can basically tailor your listing presentation to them, right? Like if you have somebody that's like I I just loves you so much. And plan on being there for an hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. and make sure you get the names of their children, the names of their pets, like their favorite, like, like all that stuff. So it just depends. So you kind of know getting into it. You should spend time with them on the phone if you think all good. Well, and to use us, right? Yeah. That's a really easy example. Yeah. That mm -hmm. I have to recognize being a high D, yeah, that Stacy needs to be able to tell me those stories. 
right? And she needs to work with us at the same time. Yeah. That in certain circumstances, she's not in the mood, and I just need to cut this short. Right. And so sometimes that, I would say, Margaret, I just need you to sign this here. Knowing <laughs> that about meeting the potential clients, the people that you meet on the street, and you being able to be the chameleon and adapt to what they need, because here's the deal they ain't adapting to you. No. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's listening and mirroring. Yeah. And I used to ask my boss. Yeah. It's yeah. It's it's sure. The dead yeah. 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 It's coming to do. So one of the things too, so like with our free listing package, it kind of hits everybody, right? So it'll hit all the ISC, right? So it'll talk about like the difference between like the photography, right? You know, so I have examples of like the high, like the crappy ones and then the nice ones, right? So like our marketing stuff in there. And so there's marketing pieces for that. There's client testimonials. Right, mm -hmm. there's people that want like the support, mm -hmm. you know. So my F's love that, right? Mm -hmm. My D's are like, how many homes did you sell? What was this? It's it, like it kind of goes through like our average price, all that stuff. So the pre-listing is just all of that stuff. So I would have to touch on every single thing in a listing presentation. Mm -hmm. I have a question, but I don't provide any box and I don't provide any pricing. I never do that. Right, that's a and a pre-listing. Pre I've never, ever, ever. ever. Yeah. Um, so some of us, I don't know if it would be to my advantage to say, oh, well, I've sold six homes. I think I go, I don't think that you, I think you, one, I think you, when I was in your, I pulled the office stuff. Mm -hmm. I used everything you okay. yeah. can So I would say our office, our brokerage is for a, and now I've finally got this one, and now I've got some yeah. reviews. Well, not yeah. three, but I at least can put them in there and it's kind of two hours. I have two, two in there. there. So it was the that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then because you're part of the coaching team, right? You can also say our team, right? And you are part of our team. Mm -hmm. Our team sells over 125 exact homes a year, which mm -hmm. is a very yeah. team state. Yeah. I was just saying that I have like private coaching here in a way as well. Yeah. So like I have a higher coaching. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I'm not yeah. Really yeah. Down. Charles, Charles put out two really interesting statistics. KW is involved in one in five sales yeah, in the yeah. and then we, they never sell customer data, client data, the database stays. So I thought that those were the things. That's that great. I would, I would absolutely call them. I mean, I would call all of it. And mm -hmm. especially if you don't have the staff that you feel that you would need, which I don't think it just, I think you just go to what you're comfortable with and then it starts to build up. Yeah. But I can tell you all the time, I'll be like, I put in the national staff, and then I put in the office staff, and then I would, you know, do all that stuff. And you just are confident with what you, you have, you know. And I want to add, it definitely helps to include it in the pre listing packet by taking the sort of offensive stance for defensive. So they already see it. And then, like you mentioned, you can focus solely on them in the in person meeting. And when I've done that in the past, they never ask me any sort of questions about yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's right there and say, so how many homes have you sold? And I'm not go, mm -hmm. that's a lot. Six. <laughs> yeah. My team. We've. But we see, I haven't used that. I mean, we've done. I mean, it's also really important. And I know some of you've heard this from me, right? Is to tell your story. Yeah. Right. And when I came into the business, right, I came from a business background. It's all high degree of confidence. I very rarely ever heard, so how long have you been in business? Right. Wow. But when I did get asked, I got a story before I had to have my elevator pitch. So my elevator pitch is I was always chuckle, and I go, well, I think my entire life has brought me here, but let me tell you the story, yeah. right? And I started in lending, and I spent 20 years in lending, stepping in steel, I talked to the finance people, led a day to day, right? And then I switched, and I went to global sales operations that taught me negotiation skills and how to put together a sales package and how to negotiate and how to do all of those things, which has led me out here, right? So what's your story? that takes the skills that you have as a realtor that you can apply yeah. from your past life, whether it's education, right? Yeah. I believe in educating people. I, mean, I come from a customer service background, or I have a master's in business or CU, whatever it is, it's like, oh, it's like yeah. I have done, 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 I have a story, and you all have things in your life and experiences that have brought you where you are today mm -hmm. that allow you to answer that question. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I did get asked one time because the brother was a jerk and he knew how long I'd been in the business. And he asked me specifically how many homes I sold. I had a decent number, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't Brittany level, right? And I remember saying, he was an executive for a very large company here in Denver. And I said, well, I said, it's funny you ask that. Because, you know, in the corporate world, we think time is the factor, right? Because, well, of course, the longer you've been in the job, the better you are. I said, well, here's what I'm learning. The average realtor sells four homes a year. And while I may have only been in the business for a year, I have sold the equivalent of seven years. Do the math. <laughs> right? And first of all, I knew that he was going to ask something like that. So I got my data pulled together. So again, if you know the information, it becomes very easy to counter the, the, yeah. the natural question mm -hmm. into a positive for yourself. Right? So I know we kind of went on topic, but mm -hmm. you know, so did you hire her by the way? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, all of us all. I did it now looking back on it, like one thing she didn't do. Uh, you never close me. No, I don't need to. Dang you on the just need to know, which is at that point, would you say, okay, I have a uh, contract all filled out? So it's I mean, yeah, so yeah, most of the time I do. So, um, everything is like all digital, right? right. So, usually I'll just say, great, I'll email me from next night, okay, and then that's it. But then you, and I mean, you need to be able to hit send. So, you ever to the and explain it to them? Have you ever I mean, speaking of, in early my career, yes. Majority of our business is all repeat, so no. So, um, can I a hundred percent? And every time, like, every time I send it, like, let me know if you have any specific questions, I'll make you go over it. Okay, just sign it. And so, um, yeah, and normally, like, if it was like, that's why I asked if she was, she's ever pulled home before, because mm -hmm. then that's one of the keys, like, how much time do I have to spend on that? Never yeah. Oh, Margaret helped yeah. me my first yeah. sales. Yeah. And I think that's important, right? You can yeah. ask questions. I can answer. Yeah. I never yeah. Yeah. So, so I have a different opinion. I believe we should go through it mm -hmm. because that's a contract. And if they don't understand it and they just blindly signed it, on one level, you could say shame on them. Yeah. Right. However, if I'm truly their fiduciary mm -hmm. and I go through every line item, oh my goodness, no. But I do go over the highlights, right? I do go over it, like, especially when we're filling in the blanks, and it's more not as much. In their opinion, it's not that they can't read it and figure it out. It's, you make sure I got this right. Here's what I'm showing as the yeah. inclusion. Here's what I'm showing as the inclusion. We've got three garage remotes, right? But, like, I'm going through the pieces of the listing agreement or the contract of mine sell so that they can, so that they know what they're signing, at least at a high level. Yeah. Now, again, if it's the investor, like if I'm working with one of the investors who buys a house a month, I'm probably not going to do it. And I have those clients, but right now I've seen have every new first time home buyer there is. So right. maybe Andy and I have So it's a good class, because it's not off topic, but a good class from Army, Colorado. The second time, and they have a checklist, they have like a form in there that you can take with you or fill out online while you're asking the questions of the listing partner or while you're walking through the house. Of what all there is. Oh, you can put it straight. Yeah, check. I can do it. I can put it straight. But I mean, right. I can do it. It's a big old thing. I just say it all. Yeah. So we don't have to put that there. Yeah. If you can right. tell us that you want to put it on the listing, because that's where they, the problem is people's listings are very flawed. And so no one's even able to search sometimes for your listing if you want to be a little more detailed. But then you can go over that and then say, okay, now I went through this with you. Did I get it right? On that list, because that's where I always think is most important. <laughs> and that also think, and that time looks very important if you have a listing manager or a transaction manager who's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 I've gotten caught twice with people. I think, yeah, I think for like us, like a couple of questions is there anything that you're taking with you that I need to talk about, right? Like, because so I have people take for my own picture. So, but so then I'm like, okay, but then you can now because that's what I'm So, like, there are certain things. Um, the 
well, I did just go to mediation two weeks ago, but prior to the only time I've ever been in a mediation about to do was over for dinner. So I asked about race every freaking time mm -hmm. because that be <laughs> one thing that people like to argue about is yeah. window covering. Our neighbor had yeah. a mirror the whole time during all the showings. Then when they moved, they put the old mirror back up. Yeah. And they did. Yeah. 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 Because people didn't want to move in and do it. They're like, wait, I don't know. They're like, oh my God. We had on this thing. Luckily, they said the same thing. I'm like, is there something that is in here that you're taking with you that I don't? And they're like, yes. That mirror in the bathroom is an antique from my grandma. I'm like, great. So put up a sign. This will be replaced with this mirror. Because I don't want to go to the station. Yeah. It's not that. Details are important. All right, what other yeah. questions do you have yeah. about the listing consultation? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I might have been. Yeah. No, we're not. I'm, I am hot and heavy in an overtime mm -hmm. listing right now, mm -hmm. and it's not fun. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 I think you can try the phone call. So Mark gonna help me with the spreadsheet of feedback showing the you know price high, 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 you know, and still us are with me. We got it down, but you know, it's just it's not fun. And I mean, do we take our prices? Getting better at not. Yeah. But it's one of those, I mean, like we took like four last year that we were like, we're not even working. I don't know what to do. Like, you know, and right. so, but that's a hard position, especially to say that to a newer agent, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Because you want something and you want to be able to have another post transaction and you want to have like, so I totally get it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we should have, I should have never agreed to Stoneware because I knew that was gonna end in a bad deal. And it really I mean we lost the listing. We were on, but we locked it in October and then it took them until February to sell it again. Um, so it, it's just one of those things, and that's not how you want to build a reputation mm -hmm. in the there's everybody thinks their house is made of gold, yeah, you know, and, yeah, and it's finding data but also kind ways to just yeah. you know explain. Well, one of the things I think that, and we didn't even talk about it, and the reason I asked Margaret what I thought her house was worth, right? Because everyone always thinks that they know what their house is worth. Mm -hmm. And Zillow has her house listed at what, 483. Yeah. It's right? It's either high or low. It's either high or low. And you need to know how, you need to have, yeah, it's like 483, 150. So, what do I pay for it? It's it, 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 it interesting. And the reason is because it goes, both ways, right? Like one of my girlfriends' dad passed away and they're trying to get establish a value on their house. So where did they go? Zillow. Mm -hmm. And then she texted me and she's like, hey, I feel like this is really low. I'm like, all right, they pull it. What's the hundred thousand? Mm -hmm. But then on Margaret's, it's like really low. I think low too, like super low. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that most people won't know on Zillow, they used to maybe not now because they're perfect firm, they used to say how off they were. And like the Denver market was, they were traditionally off by 10%, mm -hmm. which 10% is a huge number. number. Well, it's a huge number. And so one of the things to battle a high price listing is, okay, well, buyers are going to go to Zillow mm -hmm. and they're going to see that the house is only worth 483 mm -hmm. and you want to be at 550. You have a problem. But Zillow now adjusts to what you're- What it does. Yeah. 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 And so it's one of the things. Yeah, it's so funny. And so you just have to know what you're still working with. You know, I think you just have to know what you're working with. And the biggest thing is the one thing with any listing is you just have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You just have to be prepared. Like you have to know your comps. You have to know the condition of what's selling. You have to know what's active. You know, some some like what am I? I always tell them looking up my two weeks ago. And he tells me, he's like, well, you know, the house is right around the corner, it's like for 1.2. I'm like, shit, I've been that full of my comps. So I went back and looked, and it's like 3,000 square foot bigger, and it had a pool to two story. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. So 
Yeah, but I think part of that. It's so short. Sure. Like, it's like, and here's the reality. Like, I get really bigger. Yeah, that's cool. It's two story. We're dealing with a ranch, and it's a little bigger. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's human selected. Yeah, it is. Okay, so like mm -hmm. reality is we all thought there was some quarantine, like mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, but we were right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I still like it. Three right? ago, yeah, yeah. three years ago today. Yeah, yeah. three years ago. Yeah, I'm yeah. ashamed. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. 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 So the one of my favorite things to say about Zillow is, you know, Zillow is nothing more than an aggregator of data, mm -hmm. and it was it's fascinating to me that did you know. That the CEO of Zillow, on his particular home, the price was off by fifty percent. And by the way, that's true. Mm -hmm. The CEO couldn't get his own house right in his pool. Mm -hmm. Right. I use that when I when people just are yeah. like dying on the Zillow yeah. and I'll say, "Here's the reality, right? Mm -hmm. the CEO can make this right? mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. 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 Zillow hasn't been in your house. They don't know your yeah. yeah. They don't know your They're just looking at data points yeah. and they find us. And it's not a problem. It's the number. And the other thing about data points is the number is only as good as the data they get. And so we all know that not every MLS listing is very accurate or complete. Like people don't put in all the info. Yeah. Like, I mean, if I'm looking for a ranch in Castle Rock, I can't just look for one level because there are people who've been in a ranch in the basement as a two level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right, which is not accurate. Just so, I mean, <laughs> which is a in doing that. Is that an so, doing that? So, like, say there's only a third of the person who puts it in, and then Zillow is just taking all the data. So, how can we? And the data is not going to be perfect because it can't be. But that's why you're in the professional field. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. We have to, like, okay. It's a guide post over here, but yeah. it's just you know, let's look at these numbers, and that's why I'm saying 520, right. not 480, right? Or whatever it is, right? Yeah, what other questions do you guys have? This is very timely because so I'm going to talk to my niece's mother in law tomorrow about nice right sizing her, so I felt pretty confident that I liked a lot of the things you did. So, I was like, perfect. So, I want to say, first of all. She was very prepared. Mm -hmm. She ran her comps on a house that she was not getting a listing on in real life. <laughs> right? But she pulled the data. She knew my house. Mm -hmm. Right? She knew what was going on in the neighborhood. I wasn't surprised by anything she said. Mm -hmm. Right? And so thank you for putting in the time yeah, of course. to come and do this for us. Um, these truly are the four reasons. No active listing. <laughs> and your sound I don't know. And have you ever had a child? 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 Have has put in effect recently that retirement income, like my 401k, is not taxable in the state. Now, federal still taxes, right? Right? The thing is that if my 401 that I didn't pay taxes on when it went into the 401k will not be taxable if I lived in Iowa when I pulled it in. That's just things that we need to be my age to start wanting to pay attention to, especially when yeah. you have a loved ones in that area. So, yes, it was true to everything I said, except that I was in the meeting in September. I know, I could feel the tension. <laughs> I've said seven more years. Yeah. 70 is the magic years, which is another gap. I think because it builds confidence. And you can help it print it out. Like, you know, you're great. You want it memorized. That's awesome. 
And you can see this first. So you can point them like print out the MLS um, data and, and pull it up and show it to them. And a lot of times they'll, you know, they want to see something physical. So mm -hmm. I think it's completely fine if they're not able to memorize it at the start. Yeah. Well, and it's highlight too. Like I'll take it and I'll highlight and say, okay, this is a larger lot. This is a three car garage. It doesn't have the finish base. Like, so it's like easy to like for one for me to go through and be like, well, that's this, this, and that, you know. It's, it's do you take the actual MLS piece or do you just take like a spreadsheet where it's all considered? No, well, two things. So for my weekly updates, it's just a spreadsheet that I do. Um, and then so in the presentation, it'll just be like the broker, the broker showing sheet. So it doesn't have all the photo, it doesn't have all that. But I've gone through all of that. So what I normally would do is if I'm working with like 14 comparable properties. And the reality is, in this moment in the market, I'm actually doing the majority of pricing based on active and not based on mm -hmm. And so, but for Margaret specifically, there was literally no actives. I mean, I had to go five miles out um, to be able to kind of even gauge pricing um, with that. So I'm printing basically the broker filling sheet. And what I'm essentially looking for, if we're looking for obviously finished square footage, I'm looking for the garage. Um, lot size, and then any updates. But then as I'm looking at pictures in the MLS, I'm writing it down, like taking notes on it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh, this one has, you know, full kitchen remodel, less than six months old. Or so I can kind of base the conditions. You can't see that quickly. Um, so one of the things that I've heard from Diane like, Howard on that, right, is that when you were in the middle of that pricing discussion, right? Yeah. And I was taught this at time. I didn't push her too hard. I was what do you mean, right? Mm -hmm. But what Diane does, she does, she pulls up, she uses the cloud-based mandate, but I've done the same thing with printing out color print, you know, mm -hmm. um, but with the photos. Mm -hmm. And so she'll say, okay, so this one, just as Brittany said, so this one is a little bit bigger, but as you can see from the picture, right? Mm -hmm. This one's had a pretty full kitchen remote because for some people, they need that visual, right? They need to be able to see that, right? And well, many of those scenes from our very visual, right? And so to be able to pull that down, or like I think if Ricky's computer would have been working, we might have been able to go there where we could pull them up. Yeah. Say, yeah. Here's the photos, you know, here's the photos. And I think you have a most of the yeah. Right. But here's the photos of this one, and here's the photos of this one. So they, they can I was trying to get them to draw their own conclusion. And mm -hmm. one of Diana's questions was to go to every property is. Okay, so we went through the, the, the size differences, which in my house there wasn't a lot. Yeah. But is this home similar to yours? Nicer than yours? Or not as nice as yours? Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, oh, that was nicer because, right, okay, that goes in this pile. And then, okay, then she does the same thing with the next one. So then she has suddenly this spread, these, these comps it now. These aren't as nice. These are nicer and these are it. So based on what we just looked at, we're going to draw the price. And I have done that when I knew going in, I was going to have a battle. And then they guess what? They self-discover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And that self-discovery, whether you're coaching people in behaviors or you're coaching people in pricing, they suddenly self-discover is it harder. So I have to run. I have a two o'clock call. You guys are welcome to stay. Yeah. I want to see if there's more questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, I think it would be more impactful, like if you had a laptop, 